Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. On Tuesday, the Treasurer said, and I quote, the assumption is that every Australian who wants to get two shots of the vaccine will be able to by the end of the year. Does this remain the Morrison government's position? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Kitching, for the question. As I said this morning um, on the ABC, our objective is to offer every Australian the opportunity to have a vaccine before the end of this year, Mr. President. Mr. President, the uh, assumptions, the assumptions in the uh, budget papers are very different to government policy, in that the objective, Mr. President, is to offer uh, all Australians uh, access to a vaccine. Uh, by the end of the, this year, Mr. President, we have, as I said yesterday during question time, uh, continued to grow and develop the vaccine rollout based on the availability of vaccines. As more vaccine supply has become available, we have expanded uh, the vaccine rollout. We've uh, commenced with stage 1A uh, as we scheduled, and then we commenced the, pr the process in uh, vaccinating those in 1B as we scheduled. Uh, we've, brought on, uh, we've brought on GP practices and uh, 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 vaccination clinics around the country to uh, expand the vaccination rollout this week, Mr. President. Uh, we're expanding the availability of Senator vaccine. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Um, Mr. President, direct relevance. Um, Senator Kitching put a very clear quote by the Treasurer, Treasurer about the budget assumption. The simple question to this minister is whether or not that remains the government's position. I'd ask him to return the question. Senator Wong, you reminded the minister of the question. I was listening to the minister. If, if he is talking about the government's policy on this matter, um, you asked whether this remained government policy. Does this remain government policy? Oh, government's position. Sorry, I don't think that substantively changes the point of order. rule on the basis of the question. The quote was, the Treasurer said, quote, the assumption is that every Australian who wants to get two shots of the vaccine will be able to by the end of the year. Does this remain the Morrison government's position? Okay, my apologies for getting the word position and policy juxtaposed, Senator Wong. Um, you're quite right there. I do not believe, however, that substantively changes my ruling, which is that if the, gov if the minister is talking about the if the minister is talking about the vaccination policy of the government, you are asking me to frame an answer for him and put words in his mouth, and I can't instruct him how to answer a question. It was narrowly constructed, and I'm listening carefully, and if he's only talking about the government's vaccination po policy, I believe that is covered and directly relevant to the question, even if it is to be debated after question time. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And, uh, it would be nice if Labor did listen to the answers that government members gave, because, Mr. President, uh, I have, I have, in my answer already directly addressed the question that was asked by Senator Kitchen, Mr. President, uh, and I am providing additional information to the Parliament uh, with respect to the vaccination rollout, Mr. President. Uh, as of uh, uh, close of business on the 12th of May, 2,894,770 Australians have received. A vaccination that's 882,284 in the last 24 hours, Mr. President. The vaccine rollout continues to gather pace as we have available more vaccines uh, and has been controlled by, vac by vaccine availability all the way Order, through. Senator as we've Colbeck, had more vaccine time for the answer has expired. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. When asked this morning about the Morrison government's commitment for all Australians to have two vaccine doses by the end of this year. This minister said, and I quote, that's never been part of our plans. Who is correct? This minister or Treasurer Frydenberg? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said, I stand by the, the, what I said this morning. I stand by my words this morning. I stand by my words this morning, Mr. President. Order. Uh, Mr. President, and, and, and all Australians would understand that as the vaccination rollout has progressed, Firstly, there's been the issue of supply, and as more supply has become available, we've had to uh, we, we have made more available to, to Australians, Mr. President. 
And once we understood the circumstances with respect to AstraZeneca and, and had, had, the AstraZeneca, as, had the AstraZeneca vaccine available to us, which required a 12-week period between the first and the second dose, Mr. President, that has had an impact on the rollout of supply of, of the vaccination rollout, and of course the time at which people would have their first and second dose, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, we have continued, as we have additional access to, vial, to vaccine, continue to roll out the vaccine. We've made it available to people through our. Various Order, um, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answers expired. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you. In December last year, Minister Hunt said, and I quote, "We expect that Australians will be fully vaccinated by the end of October." Which of the three different positions is actually the government's position? This minister's, Treasurer Frydenberg's, or Minister Hunt's? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I've said a couple of times already today. Mr. President, we, our objective is to have, to have offered every Australian who wants a vaccine uh, one by the end of this year. Every Australian who wants a vaccine will have available one by the end of this year. Mr. Order. So, Mr. President, Order. Mr. President, vaccination, Mr. President, vaccination, Order. Mr. President, is not compulsory, Mr. Order President. Of vaccination my is Order. not Senator compulsory. Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. I actually can't hear my own voice, and I have the only microphone that's constantly turned on. Please, a little bit more silence. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, mi mi Mr. President vaccination is not compulsory. And so our objective is to provide to all Australians Order. who want a vaccination to have one available to them by the end of this year. Uh, we will continue to make available vaccines to Australians in that context as we continue the vaccination rollout and as vaccines become available. As more vaccines become available, we will put more into the rollout and we will open up more phases of the vaccination process to Australians as we get access to the vaccine, Mr President. Order. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister Order. for Employment, Sorry, Senator McMahon, I actually workforce. can't hear you. Order. Order. Senator Wong, please. I need to be able to hear Senator McMahon's question. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, the fabulous Senator Cash. We are currently seeing many green shoots with our economic recovery. Can the Minister outline how the Liberal and National Governments 2021-22 budget is securing Australia's economic recovery and helping employ more Australians? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I thank Senator McMahon for her question, and I acknowledge her deep commitment, in particular, uh, to the Northern Territory and ensuring uh, businesses stay in business and uh, jobs are created. And certainly, Mr. President, Australia entered the COVID-19 pandemic uh, from a position of economic strength. Those opposite, though, prior to COVID, they like to talk the economy down, but it was performing strongly, as we know. For the first time ever in 11 years, the budget was in balance. We actually had workforce participation in Australia prior to COVID at a record high. In excess of 13 million Australians were in work. And of course, as Senator Rustin well knows, we also had welfare dependency at its lowest in a generation. That is something that we should all be very, very proud of. Mr President, because of the strong fiscal position that the government was in at the time, it enabled us to respond decisively in putting in place a $290 billion economic support package. In terms now, though, of the government's economic and fiscal strategy, the budget very much does set out the economic recovery strategy that we have, in particular by supporting a sustainable private sector led growth and job creation. We are looking to drive down the unemployment rate lower than pre-crisis levels. And as we know in terms of workforce participation at this point in time, we still have now, even though we've been through COVID, more Australians are in employment than ever before. And in fact, the unemployment rate has fallen rapidly and is set to recover, Mr. President, 
five times faster than the last recession in the 1990s. This is a government that is committed to putting in place the economic framework so that businesses can employ more Australians. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Minister, can you please tell me how is the Liberal and National Government budget supporting regional Australians to get back into jobs now and into the future? Senator Cash. Excellent. Well, Mr. President, supporting Australians in regional Australia. That is something that on uh, the Liberal and National side of politics we are very, very proud to do. And certainly uh, the budget that uh, came down on Tuesday night, it is well and truly supporting regional Australia's economic recovery, helping to create jobs and more importantly to grow regional industries. Senator McMahon, around 43,000 Australians last year moved from the city to regional Australia, because they appreciate the benefits that are afforded to them in regional Australia. The budget that we handed down on Tuesday night it is investing, as we know, in infrastructure, regional infrastructure, right across the Northern Territory. This is all about, as Senator McMahon knows, making roads safer, reducing travel times, but at the same time supporting more than 900 direct and indirect jobs for Territorians. Again, this is a government that understands putting in place the right policy framework to create Order, more jobs Senator for Cash, Australians. Senator McMahon, a sup final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, over 947,000 jobs have come back into the economy since the trough of COVID. How is the budget continuing this jobs recovery? Senator Cash. And you're right, Senator McMahon. Almost a million people have now returned to work. Those jobs have come back into the economy since the trough of COVID-19. And that is something that we should be celebrating. Australians moving back into the workforce. And Mr President, the 2021 budget, that is the next stage of the Morrison government's economic plan to secure Australia's recovery. The budget is all about creating jobs, because that's what this government does. We create jobs, guaranteeing the essential services that Australians rely on, but also ensuring that we build a more resilient and secure Australians. And certainly we are putting in place the policy framework to do just that. Personal income tax cuts, creating more economic, economic activity. And when you create more economic activity, what do you do? You actually enable job creation business tax incentives to get businesses to invest in their businesses and to create more jobs, new apprenticeships, new training places. Again, this is a government that understands you put in place the right policy framework so businesses can prosper, grow and create Order, more Senator jobs Cash. for Australians. Senator Gallagher. Oh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Who was right? Minister Hunt, when he promised all Australians would be vaccinated by October, Minister Tian, when he said the goal is for all Australians to have a dose by the end of the year. Treasurer Frydenberg, who promised every Australian will get two shots of the vaccine by the end of the year. Senator Birmingham, who says people will still be getting vaccinated next year. Or this minister, who says <laughs> fully vaccinating Australians this year has never been part of our plans. Minister, with five different positions I've just quoted, put by five different ministers, <laughs> who is right? The Minister representing the Minister for Health. Senator Thank Colby. you, Mr. President. As I have said to, um, on, as I said on the radio this morning, and as I said in the two questions that I have been asked today, the objective of the argument of the government is to have uh, all Australians who want to have uh, a vaccine the opportunity to have a vaccine this year, Mr. President. That's the objective of the government. As we have more vaccine available. Uh, Mr. Pre Mr President, as we have more vaccine available, uh, we will increase the, av the availability to more people in Australia to get the vaccine. We started uh, with stage 1A Mr. President, uh, in February, then 1B in March, uh, and we have continued to expand the rollout as we have had more vaccine available. The availability of vaccine has always been the constraint in the context of the rollout and, of course, the rollout has also been uh, guided by the medical advice, Mr. President. So, the medical advice with respect to the AstraZeneca vaccine, where there's a requirement for a 12-week gap between the two.
doses has had an impact on the uh, on the process of, of and the timing of the vaccine rollout, Mr. President. Uh, and if Labor were honest and hadn't spent all of their time trying to undermine the confidence Order. in the vaccination rollout, Mr. President, they would acknowledge that. They would acknowledge that the availability of vaccine. Uh, the medical requirements and the advice of the health professionals which have guided the vaccine rollout have had an impact on the vaccine rollout all of the way through, Mr. President. And as we've had more vaccine available, we've made it available to Australians, and we have taken the advice of the medical and health experts in the application of the vaccine all of the way through. And that has, in, that has required, Mr. Mr. President, some resets in, in the context of the vaccination rollout, Mr. President. And we've been quite open and we've been quite honest with the Australian people about that as those circumstances have arisen. Order. arisen. Senator but, Mr. Colbeck, President, the Labor Party have not the been honest. Time for answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, yeah. a supplementary question. I'll give the minister the opportunity to be honest with the Australian people. Will the minister now tell the Senate and the Australian people when will every Australian adult who wants a vaccine be fully vaccinated? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, as I've said a number of times today, every, every Australian who wants access to a vaccine, our intention is to make that available to them by the end of this year, Mr President. Mr President, the time of their full vaccination will be dependent on when they take that up, Mr President. Uh, and Senator Birmingham said uh, recently Order. that some, some, some Australians may still be getting vaccinated next year because that may be their choice, Mr President. If they have the first dose of a vaccine that's made available to them late in December, Mr President, they won't get the second dose of AstraZeneca if that's the choice of the vaccine they take up until 12 weeks later, Mr President. They are the simple facts. Our intention, as I've said a number of times today, is to provide every Australian who wants access to a vaccine to have uh, availability of that vaccine by the end of this year. I could not have been clearer, Mr. President. If the Labor Party don't want to listen to the answer, uh, I can't help that, Mr. President. Uh, I have been very consistent uh, with Order, all of Senator my answers Colbeck, today. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On page 15 of Budget Paper 1 of last year's budget, the government said a faster than expected COVID vaccine rollout would boost the economy by $34 billion. Where is the estimate of the cost of the botched rollout in this year's budget, and what is it? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, clearly, a, a budget assumption in last year's budget papers, and as I've explained to the chamber, uh, as I've explained to the chamber, the circumstances of the vaccine rollout have changed with the advice that's been given to us, the medical advice that's been given to the government with respect to the utilisation of the vaccine and the availability of vaccine, Mr. President. So we have continued to roll out the vaccine and make it available to Australians in the context Order. of supply, Mr. President, uh, and we will continue to do that. We will continue to roll out safely the vaccine to Australians, making available to them uh, uh, the opportunity to have a dose by, of the vaccine by the end of this year, this year Mr. President. Uh, we will continue to do that. Those things, the availability of the vaccine, uh, vaccination process will be contingent on supply, and as supply grows, we will make the vaccine available to more Australians. Order. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, my question is to the minister representing the foreign minister, who I understand is Minister Birmingham. Minister, in recent weeks, violence has engulfed Israel and Palestine following the threatened evictions of Palestinian families from East Jerusalem Sheikh Jarrah neighbourhood and restrictions and violence against worship, worshippers at Al-Aqsa Mosque during Ramadan. In the last few days that violence has escalated, it's resulted in the deaths of 67 Palestinians and seven Israelis so far. Minister, do you agree that this latest devastating outbreak of violence stems from the unlawful and unjust occupation of Palestine by the Israeli government? And isn't ending the occupation the best way to end the violence? Minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, our government is deeply concerned by escalating violence in Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank. Uh, we unequivocally call on all leaders to take immediate steps to halt violence, to maintain restraint, and to restore calm. 
We also call on parties to refrain from unilateral actions that destabilise peace. The focus on all parties should be to return to genuine discussions as soon as possible. Australia has, Mr President, for many years supported a two-state solution, and this has not changed. We continue to welcome any initiative that can assist the resumption of direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. We encourage the representatives of Israel and Palestinian representatives uh, to enter into good faith negotiations and discussions. In relation to issues of settlements, the Foreign Minister issued a statement on 1 July 2020 urging all parties to refrain from actions that diminish the prospects of a negotiated two-state solution, including acts of violence and terrorism, such as rocket attacks on civilians and land appropriations, demolitions and settlement activity. Australia regularly raises our position about settlement activity with Israeli authorities. Indeed, Prime Minister and Minister Payne have both done so. The Prime Minister has already said that settlements can at times undermine peace and contribute to the stalemate, and that indeed is why the government continues to urge parties to engage appropriately order. in Senator discussions. Rice, I, sorry, Senator Birmingham. Senator Rice on a point of order. On a point of order of direct relevance, I've been very, listening very closely, Minister, and my question was very specific. Isn't ending the occupation the best way to end the violence? Respect, Senator Rice. I think the minister was being directly relevant, um, given there was a preamble as well, and I'll ask the minister to continue. Senator Birmingham. Um, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I have uh, stated the government's position, uh, and also stated in that regard uh, the advocacy the government continues to make uh, to Israel and to representatives uh, of Palestinian uh, peoples. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. Thank you, President, and thank you, Minister. Um, Foreign Minister Payne's statement yesterday called for a halt to actions that increase tensions, including land appropriations, forced evictions, demolitions and settlement activity. Do you agree that these actions undermine progress towards a two-state solution? And can you confirm that the Australian government recognises that settlements in occupied Palestine are illegal under international law? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we urge all that are involved in the current chain of violent events across Israel, Jerusalem, Gaza and the West Bank to cease provocations, to maintain restraint and to de-escalate the current exchange of fire and to halt the violence. The rocket attacks from Gaza into Israel are never justified and represent indiscriminate acts that fuel the cycle of violence and bloodshed. They must cease, and we do note that Israel, like any state, always has a right to self-defence under the UN Charter. That, Mr President, did not change the government's position uh, in relation to the long-term importance uh, of discussion between the parties uh, and ensuring that the parties avoid all measures and matters uh, that can escalate order. the chance Senator of conflict Rice, and violence. Yes, on a point Rice. of order of direct relevance again. Again, it's useful background information, but my question was whether these actions that we're talking about undermine progress towards a two-state solution and whether the government recognises that settlements in occupied Palestine are illegal you, under Senator, international law. Thank you, Senator law. Rice. Um, I take your point. Um, there were, it was a question regarding the activities of one particular party. Um, so I'll call the minister, uh, re remind the minister of the question, and he has 14 seconds remaining. Mr. President, I stress again: the current violence, the current disruption, firmly undermines progress towards a two-state solution. It undermines peace and it threatens lives. And the government urges parties to desist from such violence and, and to return to discussions. Senator Rice, final supplementary question. No answer to my first two. I'll try with a third. Minister, what actions is your government taking, both publicly and privately, to end the violence and particularly address the root cause of injustices suffered by Palestinians, namely the occupation of their country? Will the Australian government recognise a Palestinian state as a matter of urgency? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, uh, no, Mr. President, uh, the government will not. Uh, the government's position remains consistent as it has been in relation to supporting a two-state solution, urging parties to work towards that in their discussions, uh, and of course, were that to be reached, then further steps in that regard would be considered by the government. Senator Watt. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Queensland is the most decentralised state in Australia and in 2020 had the highest internal migration of any state. Can the minister confirm that in Tuesday night's budget, Queensland received the lowest rate of new infrastructure funding per person of any state? The minister, the minister representing the, the Minister nuts. for Infrastructure, Hello, Transport nuts. and Regional Development, Where are the Senator nuts? Reynolds. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Watt, for that question. Uh, what I can confirm is what the government has uh, done in this budget, and again, it's a $110 billion pipeline of infrastructure projects around the nation over the next 10 years, including, including in Queensland. Uh, for example, the $400 million for the Bruce Highway Edition funding. Uh, and many, many other projects, Senator Watts. So, for example, the $400 million for the inland freight route uh, from Mundagai to Charters Towers for the upgrades there, $240 million for the Cairns Western Arterial Road duplication, $160 million for the Munala River interchange upgrade order, for Senator packages Reynolds. one and two, Watt and an additional— Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. On relevance, we didn't ask the minister for a list of projects. We've all seen them. The question was specifically about whether Queensland received the lowest rate of new infrastructure funding per person of any state. Um, ministers are provided with uh, on the point of order or, 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 or sorry, I wasn't sure if you wanted to make point of point of order, Senator Reynolds. Ministers are given two minutes to answer the question. The minister has been going for 40 seconds. I've allowed you to remind the minister of the last part of the question. Um, I note the minister was speaking about matters related to the state of Queensland, which was covered in both parts of your question, but I'm listening carefully and she has um, 80 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I can confirm that this uh, in investment in Queensland is actually in addition to the $1.3 billion uh, that was committed in the last year's budget. And that included projects such as the Coomera Connector Stage 1, the uh, M1 Pacific Motorway upgrade, the Centenary Bridge upgrade, Corumban Creek Road uh, intersection upgrade, Order. the Mount Lindsay Highway upgrade, Order. the Beams Road open level crossing, the Riverway Order. Drive, the Bruce Highway upgrade strategy. Uh, so Queensland is an integral part of this government's $110 billion infrastructure program. And Queensland, like all other states and territories, are being funded by billions of dollars and thousands and thousands of jobs. Order. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that of the infrastructure funding the Morrison government did allocate to Queensland, only 1 per cent will actually start being spent before the next federal election? Oh Senator Reynolds. Mm. Well, in addition to the infrastructure programs, of course, we have the city deals uh, and, uh, for example, the city deal in Townsville, because this government is committed to making our cities more productive. So we're investing $381.7 million in the Townsville city deal, uh, the Horton Pipeline Order. Stage 2, uh, the Port of Townsville Channel upgrades and the city deal job creation. So far from uh, leaving Queensland behind. Queensland, across many government programs and infrastructure projects, is receiving billions of dollars from the federal government, Order. which is creating thousands and thousands of jobs right across Queensland. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. At the last election, the Morrison government committed to spend $287 million upgrading the Captain Cook Highway in Cairns, $195 million building a new water pipeline in Townsville, and $100 million upgrading the Linkfield Road interchange in the electorate of Dixon. But construction on those projects has not even begun. With this record of promises not being delivered, why should any Queenslander believe the government's new Order. promises in this year's budget? Order. Again, I remind senators, I order. Oh, Senator Reynolds, take your seat. I'll call you when I can hear you. I will ask senators again on my right on that occasion to not interject while questions are being asked. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And there is a reason in this budget that we have made it use it or lose it provisions, because the state governments 
uh, regularly get allocated money from the federal government and do not spend it as we Order. have agreed. So, you, Order. The Senator talks about water projects. Well, in the, this budget, the Australian government is committed to an additional $7.5 million towards the Rookwood Weir, half a million dollars towards the second stage of the Warwick recycled water and treatment upgrade, and there are many more. It is one thing for the federal government to Order. allocate the money, Mr. President, Senator but McGrath the state government Watt. has to deliver them. So I suggest that the question should be better directed towards the Queensland Premier. Senator Hanson, order. Have you got her number? Order. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Actually, I can answer Murray Watt's question there. Get the Senator, Labor Party Senator out Hanson, of the way from roadblocking a lot of the federal government funding in Queensland. That's what you need Senator to do. Senator Hanson, right. you're my, running down your own clock. I know. I know. My question is Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister and Treasurer. The State Grid Corporation of China is a 60 per cent shareholder in a foreign-owned company trading as Gemini. Gemini owns electricity generation assets and is the second largest owner of Australia's gas pipelines, including gas pipelines in Queensland. Gemini pays no tax in Australia because it says it has borrowed at 10.5 per cent from its parent company. Gemini says it is subject to an ATO audit for transfer pricing because of this arrangement. Despite a serious trade war with China, Gemini is seeking funding from the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility for the proposed pipeline from Mount Isa through the Galilee Basin to Roma. My question is, how much money is the federal government planning to loan to the Chinese government so China can own critical infrastructure assets in Australia? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hanson uh, for her question. It's, uh, it's a serious question in relation to the protection of critical infrastructure and security assets uh, across Australia. Uh, and indeed, our government has moved uh, in successive points over the years to make sure that we tighten areas of foreign investment laws, uh, that we ensure, for example, uh, that asset sales by state or territory governments that previously were not captured uh, for foreign investment. Uh, approval processes are now captured under those processes. Uh, through our security of critical infrastructure reforms, uh, we have also put in place new measures and are strengthening those measures even further in relation to how it is that crucial critical infrastructure assets, such as our energy systems and communication systems, uh, are appropriately protected uh, from uh, risks in relation uh, to um, uh, cyber attacks or other types of attacks uh, that could undermine their operations and, through that, the nation's security. Uh, Senator Hanson, you raise uh, questions in relation to an apparent application uh, to the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund uh, for a particular project. Uh, in relation to that particular project, uh, I would give you the assurance that our government will make sure uh, that all security implications uh, are considered. Uh, the minister has uh, a power of veto uh, over final decisions under the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund uh, and, of course, uh, in relation to matters of security concerns, would, if appropriate, uh, use that power. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Foreign powers are avoiding government review under the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeover Act of 1975 by starting new businesses, like the proposed Gemini pipeline through the Galilee Basin. When will the government plug that loophole? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, a couple of points to, uh, to that, Senator Hanson. Um, uh, one is the security of critical infrastructure reforms that I have outlined to do uh, have a reach around areas of licensing and other factors uh, that can allow government to control those who operate in certain sensitive sectors like the telecommunications industry and like parts of uh, the energy sector. Uh, I would also note uh, that the reforms to the foreign investment uh, and acquisitions uh, laws that we have, uh, have uh, outlined and, uh, and introduced include measures that ensure where a company has been granted approval to operate in one sphere and then uses that uh, to uh, expand into areas that may be sensitive and would be contrary to Australia's national interest. Uh, there are now call-in powers uh, that the Treasurer uh, can exercise uh, and can withdraw certain rights and approvals uh, to companies if they do so. 
Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Energy Australia, owned by China Power and Light, is reported to be receiving an early Christmas present from the federal government in the form of a $5 million gift card to help pay for its new Tullawarra B gas power plant so it will be hydrogen ready. How much does the, does the federal government plan to gift to foreign owned companies who don't pay tax in Australia? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, th thanks, Mr. President. Well, the question touches on a few points. Certainly, our government uh, continues to pursue measures to ensure energy security across Australia, uh, to ensure uh, that uh, we do have a reliability of supply, and, uh, and that indeed uh, requires at times uh, the, um, the driving of investment decisions forward in relation to generation of new energy in certain sectors. Uh, however, Senator Hanson, in, uh, in relation to uh, the particular uh, grants or supports, uh, I would emphasise to you that we always make sure uh, that uh, companies are operating within Australia's laws, and indeed our government has taken various steps over the years to make sure that global tax avoidance uh, measures uh, have been taken in Australia, uh, that we tighten those laws, and we are in fact yielding some billions of dollars in additional tax revenue as a result of measures that have been taken to tighten areas of global tax avoidance. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Can the Minister outline how the Morrison government's 2021-22 budget secures Australia's energy needs, secures Australia's economic recovery and protects jobs in our regions and in our cities? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Van for the question. And yes, I can. The Liberal National Government is securing Australia's recovery uh, with investment in more than $1.8 billion in the 2021-22 budget to boost jobs and to su support affordable and reliable energy. Now, through our technology, not taxes approach, this year's budget will continue to provide reliable, secure and affordable energy to all Australians, uh, and to increase investment in technology solutions to reduce emissions in a way that supports jobs and economic growth. Australia's competitive advantage has always been based on cheap energy, and gas will be central to our ongoing economic recovery. We're advancing our gas-fired recovery and ensuring that Australian gas is working for all Australians, with $58.6 million to support new initiatives. We're taking action in three Three key areas to boost the East Coast gas market across the entire supply chain. Uh, we are unlocking supply, delivering an efficient pipeline and transportation market, and empowering gas customers. We have delivered on the National Gas Infrastructure Plan interim report, which shows that both local production and new infrastructure is needed to alleviate the forecast shortfall in southern states. Now, the government can't sit back and allow the gas shortfall to eventuate. It would have a devastating impact on the economy. Uh, that's why we're backing the critical projects through $38.7 million of targeted support. Without the action we're taking to address supply, industry and households will be faced with higher prices from price gouging energy companies and more blackouts, just as South Australia experienced in 2016. On this side, we understand that gas is a critical enabler of Australia's economy. It supports our manufacturing manufacturing sector, which employs over 900,000 Australians, many in the regions. Gas will be critical to providing the dispatchable and affordable power generation we need to keep prices down Order. while Senator also deploying Seljo, new technologies the into the expired. system. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government investing in our regional industries and supporting job creation across Australia? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, our investments in this year's budget will create more than 9,000 jobs across the country, uh, grow our economy and ensure Australia continues to meet and beat our international commitments. And I know Senator Wish Wilson will be very pleased with that. Through the 2021-22 budget, we are investing an additional $275 million to accelerate the development of an Australian hydrogen industry. And this new funding 
will increase the government's total support for a hydrogen industry to over $845 million. This package will support an additional four regional hydrogen hubs. This is in addition to the $70.2 million committed in last year's budget for the first hydrogen hub. And we'll look far and wide around the nation for potential hub sites, from the Air Peninsula in the south to Darwin in the north. Uh, and together with our investments uh, in carbon capture and storage, this will create around 2,500 jobs, delivering on our technology-led plan to secure the economic recovery and continue the jobs growth. Order, Senator Seselger. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise of other measures in the budget that will ensure all Australians have access to secure, reliable and affordable energy? And is the minister aware of any risks to this approach? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, unlike those opposite, uh, Liberals and Nationals understand that delivering affordable, reliable and secure energy is absolutely critical to protecting jobs and securing Australia's recovery. That's why our budget funds new gas generators and invests in the technologies we need to lower prices for families and businesses. Now, what's Labor offering? Just what their Greens counterparts would, would like. They only have a recipe for more taxes, more power blackouts and higher prices. They've got Chris Bowen uh, in charge of energy policy, who's never seen a tax he didn't like. They've got Murray Watt, who continues to pretend to support the resources sector. They are completely divided when it comes to the role of gas in the system. They apparently have an energy plan for 2050, but not 2030. They simply can't be trusted uh, to deliver the reliable, affordable energy Australians deserve. We reject Labor's attempt to hoodwink Australians. Australians know that it will be technology, not Order. taxes, that Senator will secure Sussell, our recovery, and that's exactly what this— Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. My question is to Minister Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. Tuesday's budget was a shocker for the planet. With just 0.3 per cent, 30 cents in every $100 of budget spending dedicated to addressing climate the climate crisis and just 0.2 per cent of the budget, 20 cents in every $100, dedicated to the environment, the environment is suffering. Why did the Morrison government make the environment and climate change the biggest losers out of this year's budget? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, I do completely reject Senator Hanson yeah. Young's question yeah. and assertions yeah. in her question. I invite Senator Hanson Young to take a look at the ocean strategy outlined in the budget and to see the measures there, measures indeed Order. consistent with a blue economy. I invite her to take a look at the waste reduction strategy there, measures consistent with our government's action to ban the export of recyclables and waste from Australia. I invite her to take a look indeed at the climate and emissions reduction measures that are there outlined in detail and mr president most importantly delivering results delivering results that are ensuring we are avoiding according to the forecast of our emissions we will avoid in the order of 250 million tons of emissions each year by 2040 this is building on the fact that we have continuously met and exceeded our nation's commitments we expect to see around 20 billion dollars of investment in low emissions technology over the decade to 2030 as a government helping to secure around $80 billion in total investment from the private sector and governments. It's working, it's meeting and beating our targets, and we're committed to policies that will continue to do so. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Funding for biodiversity protection has fallen under this government since they were elected in 2013 by 28 per cent. Spending on biodiversity is to fall over the next three years to make it half of what it was in 2013. How many more native species and Australian members of the Australian wildlife family will be extinct before this government starts funding biodiversity properly? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, we are going to continue to invest in those areas that are essential towards our environmental protection. I don't, accept, I don't accept the assertions in relation to the way in which the Greens have made their own budget calculations. It would come as little surprise to anybody uh, that I'm not accepting the assertions or the ideas that the Greens' budget calculations are likely to be accurate, truthful or honest. Uh, so, Mr President, uh, I give the commitment that our government continues to invest practical environmental initiatives to improve our landscape across Australia, to protect our oceans, to deal with waste and to reduce emissions. 
Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Minister, why does this budget do nothing to save koalas from extinction by 2050? Why does this budget do nothing to save swift parrots from extinction? Why does this budget do nothing to protect platypus, quolls, pygmy possums, potteries and the hundreds of other species that are left on the list? Our wildlife is suffering and you are doing nothing. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, that's just not true. It's a falsehood from the Australian Greens and, yet and, and yet another one indeed, Senator Abetz. It's unsurprising to anybody on this side of the chamber or to anybody who has heard the Greens over the years claim, of course, endlessly, endlessly that things aren't happening when in fact they are. We've all heard, we've all heard the Greens say that we wouldn't meet any of our emissions reduction targets over the years, and yet, of course, then each time we do meet them, we do exceed them. Uh, and so the Greens say this endlessly. Yes, we take very seriously the importance of wildlife protection, preservation, of course, of endangered species, uh, and the pursuit in relation to measures and policies to help support them is one we will continue. Senator McCarthy. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister confirm that 99 per cent of new infrastructure funding announced on Tuesday for the Northern Territory is beyond the forward estimates? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank the Senator for the question. And I can confirm that since 2013, the Australian government has committed more than $3.2 billion for infrastructure in the Northern Territory. And in the Senator 2021 McCarthy, budget— Senator Reynolds. Senator McCarthy, on a point of order. Uh, Mr President, my point of order is that uh, we're talking about beyond the forward estimates. Thank you. Um, the minister has been speaking for 13 seconds. Um, I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. You've reminded the minister of the conclusion of your question. Um, I will listen carefully to the minister's answer. I call her to continue. Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, my key message is that there are many, many different programs across the federal budget over multiple budget years uh, that are putting money into the Northern Territory. So not only are the city deals, for example, for the city of Darwin is a 10-year partnership, and that's $320 million. Uh, in this budget alone, we've got $150 million for phase two of the Northern Territory National Network highway upgrades, $173 million towards a sixth corridor under the roads of strategic importance, and uh, $300 million, sorry, $3 million for a development study for a order. proposal Senator of Tennant Creek. McCarthy, Senator, sorry, Senator, Reynolds, Senator McCarthy on a point of order. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, point of order on relevance. Uh, the question is beyond the forward estimates. So, I have been listening carefully to the minister's answer, and I've allowed you to specifically remind her of that. If a question asks about a matter in the budget paper in a portfolio area, the minister is constraining her comments to, in essence, infrastructure projects in the Northern Territory. If I'm being asked to, to insist that she uses words to address the, uh, the point of order in the specific nature you make it, I believe I'm crossing the line into instructing a minister how to answer the question. The minister is not straying into broader commentary about alternative policies, but is speaking about infrastructure in the Northern Territory. I believe that is directly relevant. Um, there is, of course, the opportunity after question time to debate it. Senator Wong on the point of order. On the point of order, and I am not clear whether the minister is continuing to speak about the past, but what I would submit is that a question about the forward estimates and beyond, that an answer that refers to past investment is not directly relevant to the question. I mean, temporally makes no sense to suggest that you can answer a question about future spending only by, by referencing past spending. I think, to be fair, the way I heard the minister answering the question was the minister was addressing and listing projects currently underway, not within the forward, not not beyond the forward estimates. I think going into the territory of instructing a minister that in a portfolio area they can't talk about the budget to that degree of specificity is actually getting into the content. At, no, if, if um, the minister is talking about projects that are currently underway but they are within the forward estimates, there's an opportunity to debate whether the minister has answered the question to your satisfaction after question time. But I don't think I can say that's not directly relevant because there's no broader 
because the Minister is constraining her comments to that specific issue of that policy area. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And the point I was making is that we have been supporting the Northern Territory in a wide range of infrastructure projects uh, for all of the budgets, I believe, that we've had on, since coming into government. And don't forget that we do this in partnership with the Northern Territory government. And in fact, we support projects uh, that they put forward and that are shovel ready. So I've just had a look here over the last budget and this budget. I can count at least 30 separate projects which are in various stages of construction, and some are in planning, some are in approved, and they go out well, well into, well beyond the forward estimates. So the fact that funding goes beyond the forward estimates is a good thing because that means there is a steady pipeline of projects in the Northern Territory to sustain jobs probably for at least a decade, if not more. So that, I think, is a great thing done by this government. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that 87 per cent of the newly announced infrastructure spending for Victoria announced in this year's budget is beyond the forward estimates? Senator Reynolds. Uh, I'd have exactly the same answer as I did for the Northern Territory. Is there are very significant projects across multiple uh, projects uh, that have been funded in this year's budget. Again, it's done in consultation with the Victorian government in terms of the readiness of the projects and in terms of the duration of the project. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. On average, the Morrison government delivers $1.2 billion less a year on infrastructure than it promises. Last year, Mr Morrison delivered $1.7 billion less in infrastructure, and how much less than promised will be delivered this financial year? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And like many things those opposites say, that is simply not true. This government has got a $110 billion 10-year infrastructure program, uh, and it is very clearly laid out in the budget. And we are spending more on infrastructure year on year, and we do that in partnership with the state and territory governments. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services, and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. How is the Morrison government securing Australia's recovery by implementing policies to enable Australia to become a leading digital economy and society? The Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President, and I'd like to thank Senator Bragg for his question, his enduring interest in Australia's digital economy and progress. Digital technologies play such an important role in our daily lives, but perhaps no more so than in the last 18 months. They've helped businesses to stay afloat, for people to interact and transact in new and different ways, and they've also enabled people to get access to life-saving and information and services. The Morrison government knows that getting the set policy settings right now will ensure that Australia's prosperity continues over the next decade and beyond. And that's why, Mr. President, I was incredibly proud to stand with the Prime Minister last week and announce the $1.2 billion digital economy strategy. This strategy is a living plan designed to ensure that we have the right infrastructure, skills, settings and services in place. It outlines our digital growth priorities that will make it clear what we need to do to achieve that ambition. And they include things like lifting our digital capability and adoption across small and medium businesses to support new ways to work and grow, incre increase profitability and, of course, save time, for example, through uh, a $15.3 million enhancement to uptake uh, e-invoicing to save time and money for businesses, supporting globally competitive export sectors operating at the digital frontier, including manufacturing, mining, agriculture and construction, and, of course, building the emerging technology capability and accelerate the growth of tech startups such as fintechs, regtechs and digital games to drive an uplift in the rest of the economy. And this uh, broad package, Mr President, has been received extraordinarily well. Fintech Australia CEO Rebecca Schott-Guppy said the announcement was welcome news for the entire technology and startup ecosystem. The BCA said the digital economy was a win -win. The digital economy strategy is a win-win, and the Interactive Games and Entertainment Association said that the games offset, tax offset, a key part of that strategy, was one of the most significant to be implemented anywhere in the world. Yeah. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, how is the government investing in technology and skills to support job creation and economic growth following the COVID-19 pandemic? Mm. Senator Hume. 
Mr President, the Morrison government understands the importance of the digital e technology to, uh, to Australia's economic recovery, and that's why we've announced this $1.2 billion package to ensure that we have the right infrastructure, skills, services and settings in place to assure Australia's ongoing prosperity. For example, we're investing $124 million in AI initiatives to grow the next generation of AI experts and help small and medium enterprises leverage technology to boost productivity. We're investing $12.7 million into the exp expansion of the hugely successful successful and oversubscribed ASBAS program to ensure that 1,700 businesses get access to services that will help them grow and leverage digital technologies. And these are just a handful of the initiatives put into place to ensure opportunity, growth and jobs for all Australians now and to, into the future. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Uh, how is the government working to help people have greater control of their data? Senator Hume. Mr President, this is a matter very close to my heart. Empowering individuals and businesses to have better control and gain benefit from their own data that's collected by industry is an important part of the Morrison government's $1.2 billion digital economy strategy. $111, sorry, $111 million will help accelerate the economy-wide rollout of the consumer data right, which will provide enormous opportunities for regtechs and fintech startups to drive competition, building new products and services to help consumers manage and understand their data and get better, better value from products and services providers such as telcos, banks and energy companies to save time and save money. And importantly, the consumer data right is delivered in partnership with industry and has privacy settings embedded into its design to ensure it's a safe and secure system. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for the uh, National Disability Insurance uh, Scheme and Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said that the Australian Federal Police had given the go-ahead for Mr Gaitchens to resume his investigation into uh, who knew what and when about the alleged rape of Ms Higgins in the uh, Minister's ministerial office. Has the Minister been interviewed by Mr Gaitchens? The Minister for Government Services and the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. No. Senator Farrell. Thank you. Yes, I have another supplementary question, uh, <coughs> Mr. President. Uh, have any of the minister's staff been interviewed by Mr. Gaitchens? Senator Reynolds. Uh, not to my knowledge. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I do have a final uh, supplementary. Can the minister guarantee that neither she nor a member of her staff inform the prime minister or any of his staff of the alleged sexual assault? prior to the 12th of February this year. Senator Reynolds. Senator Farrell, that really relates to the ongoing AFP inquiry that I addressed in my uh, comments yesterday. Order. And I certainly have no desire to prejudice that, that investigation. Order. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's budget will help create a safer, healthier and more prosperous Pacific region, and how securing the Pacific's recovery helps secure Australia's own recovery? The Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you very much. I thank Senator Patterson for the question. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused immense disruption here in Australia and across our region. And our response is simple. We are supporting Australians and we're supporting our region. And through this budget, the government is investing in an open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific region. Now, Labor uh, is maintaining an outrageous lie that we have cut development funding in the budget. Let me be perfectly clear. We've maintained Australia's baseline $4 billion ODA budget, which will continue over the forward estimates rising in the out years. And in response to the pandemic, the government is delivering $1 billion worth of additional investments over the years to 2023 24, over $800 million this year and next. Uh, we make no apology uh, for the government front-loading these investments. Uh, is Labor really arguing that we should hold off on supporting our neighbours at this critical time as they are dealing, as they are dealing with— No, well, you got it wrong. You Order. got it wrong. The government, we're, we're not going to take your advice and hold it back. Hold back the additional assistance at a time of crisis. The government has demonstrated again and again that we will allocate new funding in response to the need Order. now right region. COVID-19 has created a highly Order. poor Senator, 
international Roland environment. McAllister. And the government's temporary and targeted measures are exactly the right tool to respond to that environment. In the year ahead, we'll provide $262 million to support our region's vaccine procurement, $156 million to address the economic impacts of the, of the pandemic. And in 2021, we delivered approximately $1.7 billion in ODA to the Pacific, over 50 per cent higher uh, than Labor delivered to the region when last in office. So we're not going to be lectured to by the Labor Party about our commitment to support our Pacific family and our Pacific neighbours. Senator Patterson, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how supporting our partners in the Pacific to tackle and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic as quickly as possible will support economic growth both in Australia and across our region? Senator Selger. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Senator Patterson, for the question. Uh, the human suffering caused by COVID is immense, uh, but equally uh, its impact on long-term economic stability and security uh, is also uh, concerning. The government has committed $305 million to support economic resilience and recovery from COVID-19. Already $200 million has been dispersed to our nearest neighbours. Uh, in the year ahead, Australia will provide a further $100 million across the Pacific and Timor-Leste to maintain essential services and protect the most vulnerable. Countries like Fiji, which are highly dependent on international tourism, the shutdown of international travel has been absolutely devastating. Uh, we can help Fiji to get the virus under control and support its quick return to economic growth. I'll be speaking to the Fiji Health Minister today about our cooperation and we'll be delivering more Australian vaccines to Fiji this week. Uh, we'll always support our Pacific family. A safe region means a safe Australia and our support at this time is more important Order. Than Senator ever. Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate how the budget builds on the government's record investments in the Pacific? And can the minister outline the comprehensive nature of this government's engagement with our Pacific neighbours? Senator Seselja. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. I can. and In doing so, uh, we, we reject Labor's lazy approach to our engagement in the region. Uh, what those opposite don't understand is that Australia's partnership with Pacific nations extends far beyond the record ODA budget alone in the Pacific. Order. Labor seems to believe that bilateral ODA remains the only way in which Australia addresses shared challenges in our region. By contrast, uh, this government is using a range of economic tools to support economic stability and grow jobs in our region. We're providing bilateral loans to our most important near neighbours, PNG and Indonesia, at a crucial moment in their COVID-19 response efforts. The loan to Indonesia is part of our biggest package of economic support to Southeast Asia since the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. And this government has established the $2 billion Australian infrastructure financing facility for the Pacific, which is helping to deliver strategically significant projects such as the Palau ICT cable project, Order, the Markham Valley Senator, Solar project Sir in Selger, PNG, Senator and the Birmingham. Tina River Hydro, Order, Hydro Senator project. Selger, time for the answer has expired. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President. It started at 2.55. Mr. 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 President, it, it did start at 2.55, and it being two minutes to four, yeah. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Yeah. Are there any uh, motions to take note of answers? Um. Senator McAllister, sorry. Uh, thanks very much, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senator Kitching and Senator Gallagher. Well, Mr Morrison promised that four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March. Well, he's failed that test. Now it's the start of May and we are only at 2.8 million. In fact, the Prime Minister has failed pretty much every vaccine test that he has said himself. He promised that all of Group 1A would be vaccinated by Easter. Failed that test. He promised that 6 million Australians would be vaccinated by the 10th of May. Well, Monday's come and gone, hasn't it? Monday's come and gone, and we're at 2.8 million. The Prime Minister has previously promised that all Australians will be vaccinated by the end of October. But now that seems impossible, doesn't it? Because at the current rate of vaccination, 400,000 a week, 
we will not get there until 2023. Weirdly, that's not what it says in the budget papers, is it, though? Because the budget papers assume that all Australians will be fully vaccinated this year. But the Prime Minister is now backing away from that at a rate of knots. Yesterday, he was trying very hard, very hard to distinguish in his media appearance between a policy setting and an assumption. Now, that is a distinct distinction that actually won't make sense to many Australians. And Senator Colbeck's answers today will certainly not make that any clearer. He spent a considerable amount of time today trying to distinguish between sort of policies, uh, positions and assumptions and the grey zone of semantics between those ideas. But Australians actually don't need another word salad from this appalling minister who oversaw a shambles of a response to the threat of COVID to aged care residents. They actually just want a simple answer to a simple question. When will all of Australia be vaccinated? Because it's not a moot question. It's not, a, uh, it's not an unimportant question. The reason that the budget includes information, assumptions about vaccination, is because it has a real impact on Australia's ability to recover economic, economically from the effects of the pandemic. A vaccinated Australia is less vulnerable to the risk posed when a positive case escapes from hotel quarantine. A vaccinated Australia won't have to have a widespread lockdown if community transmission is detected. A vaccinated Australian can travel, supporting vulnerable jobs in Cairns and in Launceston. And that is the reality for many countries. And the Prime Minister promised us last year that we would be first in line first in line, front of the queue for vaccines. Well, according to analysis by the Financial Times, we're actually ranked 104th internationally in the rollout. And economists are telling us that all this delay caused by this incompetence will cost the Australian economy billions of dollars. This is something that the Prime Minister should have and could have taken charge of personally. The Morrison government has badly mishandled sourcing vaccines. And today's announcement about sourcing Moderna vaccines is honestly long overdue. Labor has been calling for months now for the Australian government to strike a deal with Moderna for access to their state-of-the-art mRNA vaccine. That's a position that the government has consistently rejected as recently as the last few weeks. And at the heart of this, is his failure by Mr Morrison to take responsibility. He loves the job. He clearly loves the job, but he doesn't really like doing the work. He would rather lean on the state premiers. He wants a photo taken with them when things go right. He's nowhere to be seen when things go wrong. Just like in the bushfires, nowhere to be seen unwilling to take responsibility for the things that really matter to this country, always willing to point the finger, always finding someone else who is responsible for the things that have gone wrong, but never willing, never willing to stand up and actually take responsibility for the things that will make a difference in the lives of ordinary Australians. They should stop pretending that the vaccine rollout is going well. They should stop blaming other people who draw attention to the failures. They should face up to the problems they have created because Australians and the economy are paying the price. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I do take pleasure in rising today uh, actually to address this issue that uh, Labor senators are, are raising in this place. Uh, what this government is proving is an am, am, oh, what's the word? They're ambidextrous in, in our ability to deal with the challenges of, of the supply of vaccine, our ability to, to, to connect with, with reality, something that we don't see uh, much on this other side of the, the chamber. Professor Murphy said that it is absolutely vital for Australia to be prepared for variants to the coronavirus and the Moderna deal which was, has been announced, uh, provides extra diversity and redundancy in the country's vaccine arsenal. Now, this is phenomenal. This is great. 
because we know that there's been uh, supply constraints, we know that there's been issues, and it's your ability to deal with them when they arise. And that's what this government is proving: its ability to adapt, to shift, to work towards solutions. And that's what our Prime Minister and our Health Minister and others that are involved, the, the, the great officials that are involved in, in negotiating terms and negotiating deals to see the, the, the delivery of these vaccines. What the Morrison government is doing is proving its ability to be ambidextrous, to modify, to adapt as the circumstances change. And Australians, they, they can make sense of this. They get that. They get that. They respect the fact that when circumstances change, you, you have to shift, you have to adapt, and you have to move quickly. Now, this is what the Morrison government has done in terms of this vaccine. With the announcement of an agreement for the Moderna vaccine, which secures a further 25 million doses. Uh, the total number of vaccines that are going to be available to Australians has now increased to 195.4 million doses of vaccine. That provides us with options. That provides us with options to be able to shift. If there's issues, we can shift to others. There's opportunity that's been provided here by this government. Now, sadly, Labor have proven yet again their inability to, to adapt. They, they come in here with their same old and tired tactics of fear and cynicism in some you know, maybe misguided attempt to score some political point, but really they have no clue. All they're doing is just revealing that they don't have a clue about what Australians care about. Because if they did, then they'd be coming in here and asking questions and inquiring about the very substantial budget statement that was delivered by the Treasurer. So the question of Labor's ability, Labor's ability to be able to adapt and move uh, to where we need to go is, is really in question right now. And it's a question that's before uh, Labor and Labor members and people that support the Labor Party when they're, when they're looking at what Labor's position is, is you know, what will they do with the maybe the third round of tax cuts that are that are that, that, that are presented uh, that this government is has uh, put forward. Uh, where, where's Labor's position on this? Will they be ambidextrous? Will they be? Will they present uh, th themselves with the ability to be able to move and to be able to shift and be able to recognise the times that we're dealing with? Because Australians care about this. This is something that Australians want to see. They want to be able to take home more of the money that they earn. But there is deathly silence. On that side, we're not hearing what Labor would do. Mr. Frydenberg said that uh, that uh, if the opposition leader abandoned the government's tax cuts, which would abolish the 37% per cent tax bracket, leaving earnings between 45,000 and 200,000 tax at 30%, uh, and he said that uh, the, the treasurer said that that this would um, that this would create a system that was. Uh, uh, that, that was uh, unaffordable, uh, it, it, we, and we must create a stronger system. Mr. Frydenberg said that the Labor Party has not said if it is committed to stage three. They've not said whether they're committed to stage three, even though at the time it passed through the parliament they said that they supported these tax cuts. But there's been silence from the opposition leader. There's been silence from senators, Labor senators, as they've come in here in this place. Now, this would mean that individuals that are in an income, uh, if they abandon these uh, th stage three or of the proposed, or if they abandon it, it would mean that somebody on $80,000 a year, a middle income earner, would be $900 a year worse off. $900 a year worse off. Now, these are the issues that Australians care about. These are the issues that are on uh, front of mind. When Australians are working, to, are working very hard and working hard to pay their bills, they want to know, can they keep more of the money that they earn? Where's Labor's interest with the Australian people, I wonder? Thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I also rise to take note of uh, questions from Senators Gallagher and Kitching to uh, uh, Senator Colbeck uh, in relation to the uh, failed vaccine rollout. Uh, you can see the penny dropping for senators opposite. It's, it's been going all week. You see, on the other side, they thought they'd got away with it. A catastrophic bungling of the most important public health program uh, in Australia's political history, vital for our public health, vital for the future of our economy, 
Uh, and at the beginning of this week, you could see it in their faces as they came in here on the balls of their toes that they thought they'd got away with it, that the criticism has been muted. Now, in fact, what has happened is households across the country have just shrugged their shoulders because it's more of the same from the Morrison government. We've gone from, I don't hold a hose, mate, to I don't hold a dose, mate. We've gone from broken promises, more announcements, more spin uh, over the bushfire crisis, to broken promises, more announcements, more spin, more marketing over another issue that's vital for the public health, uh, vital for the economy and vital for every household in the country. You could see it in the lacklustre tone, the excuses, the dissembling, the lack of interest, the lack of a sense of urgency from Minister Colbeck in question time today, uh, just like when he's had responsibility for aged care. Remember, neglect was the title of the report that, that made an assessment of his performance as the aged care minister. Everything that this minister touches turns to custard. See, the COVID-19 pandemic for them has just been a distraction from what they see as the real business of government, staying in government and looking after themselves and their mates. We've had a cycle of announcements and promises over the COVID-19 vaccine rollout that has been accelerating as the sense of crisis and failure has lifted. Last year, the Prime Minister promised that Australia would be at the front of the queue for vaccination. <coughs> at the beginning of this year, the Prime Minister promised that four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March. Today, well, the promises and announcements accelerate. Five different positions from the Prime Minister and the Treasurer and various assorted ministers. And the problem for Minister Colbeck answering questions in the Senate today is that while he's entitled to be confused about the government's position, it's really quite a simple proposition. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. You just tell the truth. Well, the truth is that Australia has vaccinated just 2,736,107 people. We are 81st in the world in terms of the percentage of our population vaccinated. In raw terms, there are 15 countries that have a smaller population that have vaccinated more people. It's a geography lesson, really. Singapore, Switzerland, Austria, the Czech Republic, Serbia, the United Arab Emirates, Israel, Belgium, Sweden, Portugal, Hungary, the Netherlands, Romania, Chile and Greece have all vaccinated more people and have a smaller population. Chile has six million fewer people than Australia. They have vaccinated 16 million people in their population, fully vaccinated, almost as six times as many people as Australia has. How can that be that this country has performed so poorly, there's been such willful neglect of this basic requirement of government? that this Prime Minister has not been able to grasp the nettle, to do the right thing by Australians and Australian families, and has left us stranded, exposed, isolated, vulnerable to future uh, outbreaks of this, vaccine, uh, of this virus, a quarantine system that is fundamentally compromised, unable to take responsibility for quarantines and vaccines, he's left Australian households at, some, at the mercy of the pandemic you, and a future Ears, economic crisis. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, I, I thank the Labor Party for raising this very important issue. And, uh, yes, it, we are at a, a, in the middle. We are still in the middle of an international pandemic. But you know, the Labor Party continue to talk us down. They continue to talk down Australia, which has by far exceeded the rest of the world in managing COVID cases, in ensuring we have the best practice for testing and tracing 
and managing outbreaks of COVID so that we have actually got through this pandemic um, with very low statistics. So um, when we're talking about the actual vaccination rollout, the sense of urgency that other countries have is not experienced here in Australia. We are getting the vaccination out the door. We are entering into negotiations with companies to ensure that we've got enough vaccinations going into the future to ensure that we can vaccinate our entire population. And importantly, in a country like Australia that is so big and so diverse, but with such a disparate population, we are ensuring that we can manage to get the vaccination out to the people on the ground in the regions where it's needed. We are utilising every possible uh, mechanism to get the vaccination out there. We are working with our general practices. We've got over 5,000 general practices registered to be able to give vaccinations. That is throughout Australia. That is not 5,000 general practices located in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. That is general practices like in my hometown of Daniloquin, where my local health clinic is giving COVID vaccinations. We are working with the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services to ensure that our Aboriginal communities in some of the most remote locations in Australia are not forgotten as we manage the rollout of this vaccination. These are all things that take time to develop, but we've done that. They are all things that ensure that we are flexible and we can pivot to need. We're even working with the Royal Flying Doctors Service to ensure that people on our most remote stations have access to the vaccine, because we're not focused only on where the pandemic has occurred in our cities, where we've had the majority of outbreaks. We are focused entirely on ensuring that every Australian who wants a vaccination can access a vaccination. And we should be proud. I mean, uh, Senator Ayres uh, made the point that Australia is 81st in the world in terms of getting the vaccinations rolled out. But he fails to mention that uh, our case numbers are 120th in the world. But when you look per capita, our case numbers are much, much lower than all of the countries that the Labor Party are focusing on comparing us to. We don't want to be the next India. We don't want to be the next United Kingdom or the next USA. We want to make sure we stay ahead of the pack so we are managing the entire pandemic. We are not focusing just on vaccinations because we know that the best way to get through this pandemic is to continue to ensure that we don't have major outbreaks, to continue to work with our state partners of all political colours on their management of COVID, to ensure that we can manage any incoming COVID from returning Australians. Um, and we are working constructively through National Cabinet to also get the vaccinations out the door. New South Wales last week opened their first uh, major vaccination hub at Sydney Olympic Park, and that has been going very successfully with massive registrations of people and um, bringing forward the phases of the rollout as required, as advised by our health experts who we listen to, we continue to listen to, and um, we continue to work with the scientific community to manage this pandemic as we go on. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I also rise to take note of questions by Senators Kitching and Gallagher to Senator Colbeck. And what we got in the answers today was more waffle from a government far more focused on the politics of the vaccine rollout rather than the delivery of it. And this is something we've come to expect after eight long years of this government that has always been far, far more focused on announcements than deliveries. 
We have seen it time and time again. A job maker program meant to create 450,000 jobs, which only created 1,100. A Federal Integrity Commission, nowhere to be seen. $4 billion in national disaster recovery, not spent. But this time the government's outdone themselves. They've outdone themselves on the all announcement, no delivery, because this time they haven't just bungled the delivery, they've bungled the announcements. So they announced 4 million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March, and they failed to deliver that, because it's now May and we've got about 2.8 million vaccinated. So they tried to announce something again, and then they failed, they failed to deliver the re-announcement. We've got five goes from five different ministers. Minister Hunt, who promised all Australians would be vaccinated by October. Minister Tian, who promised or who said that the goal was for all Australians to have a dose by the end of the year. Treasurer Frydenberg, who promised every Australian will get two shots of the vaccine by the end of the year. Senator Birmingham, who said that people would still be getting vaccinated next year. And Minister Colbeck, who has said vaccinating Australians this year has never been part of the government's plans. Five, five different attempts at re-announcement from five different ministers. And I've got to give you guys credit, right? Because we thought we had you worked out. We thought we had your measure. We thought you were all announcement, no delivery. Great at the announcement, political geniuses at that, but always failing on the delivery. But you tricked us, because you can't even announce it properly. You not only no announcement, no delivery, you can't even do the announcements properly. Five different positions from five different ministers. Five attempts at an announcement from five different ministers. It's ridiculously hard to keep up. And the fact is, in all these failures, the failures in delivery particularly, you're letting Australians down so very badly. But it's not good enough to bungle this. It's one of your few jobs in the COVID recovery, right? Vaccinations. And you're bungling it. It's not good enough for Australians. It's not good enough for vulnerable Australians especially, who are still scared, who are still anxious, waiting for their vaccine, because that vaccine for them is a ticket to a more normal life. It's a ticket to safety. It's a ticket to being able to go back into their community and not live with that deep-seated fear they live with every day. For our aged care workers, who are going through an extraordinarily difficult time at the moment, with this anxiety on top of them, they're not all vaccinated yet. The fear they live with every day is intolerable. For our frontline healthcare workers who are exhausted, exhausted from this pandemic, who want to be vaccinated and are not yet vaccinated, it's not good enough for them. It's not good enough for all the Australians who need this vaccine and aren't able to get it. It's not good enough for our economy because we know the reopening of our economy the, the full redevelopment, the growth that we know we need to see in our economy depends on jabs in arms, jabs you cannot deliver. It's not good enough for our economy. It's not good enough for vulnerable Australians. It's not good enough for aged care workers. It's not good enough for frontline health care workers. It's not good enough for any of us. So instead of tying yourself in knots, bungling announcements, to then go on and bungle the delivery of those announcements and re-announcements, which we just can't even catch up with. Just do better. Do better for all Australians who need you to do better on one of the few jobs you have. Do better for our economy. Do better for our vulnerable Australians. Do better on this vaccine rollout. Do better so we can start getting back to normal. Do better so people can be less anxious and less in fear. Just do better for Australia. It's about time. Thank you, Senator Smith. So the question is that the motion to take note of answers is moved by Senator McAllis to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. I rise to take note to responses to question eight by Senator Hanson Young uh, from Minister Birmingham. Of all the <coughs> untruths, of all the deception, of all the spin. In fact, if I could use some pub vernacular, Deputy President, 
of all the bullshit we hear in this place about climate change from the coalition. Perhaps the biggest mistruth of all is that somehow there's a trade-off. That somehow there's a trade-off between the economy and action on climate change. There isn't. Action on climate change is important for the economy. It's not just an important opportunity to create new industries, new innovation, new jobs and solve an environmental problem. It's important because there is no bigger cost to our economy than climate change. There is no bigger threat to our national security than climate change. How often do we think about the extreme weather events that cause the outages in power, that cause the problems we heard today at Question Time about a stable, reliable, low-cost energy source? Most of the problems in our grid are caused by heat waves and cold snaps caused by our changing climate. The damage caused by prolonged droughts to our rural and regional areas, the lack of rainfall, the mental health issues, the disruption to essential services and essential assets from cyclones, from floods, from heat waves, from storms. We've all seen it. We've all experienced it. Where I'm giving this speech in Canberra, in the Australian Senate, just one summer ago, the summer leading into 2020, we experienced the most extraordinary period of extreme weather events and disruptions to the community, to the economy, to the areas in southern New South Wales, all the way to the north coast, down to Tasmania, across Victoria, Australian citizens being evacuated from beaches by the Australian Navy, the loss of millions of animals, the construction costs to communities to rebuild. That's just a tangible cost of what it costs to rebuild their houses and their infrastructure and their facilities. It can't even begin to estimate the cost and damage to their lives, to the fabric of their communities. But we ignore that in this place, in our short-term self-interested debates that we have on climate action. Somehow a technology that we've been talking about for 20 years is going to mysteriously solve our problems by creating lower emissions and a reliable, safe power source. Well, I don't know if that's a pig that's flying over the Senate right now, Acting Deputy President, but I'll tell you what, I'm fed up with this government's excuses and distractions from real climate change, and I know most Australians are as well. Senator Hanson Young mentioned today that this government has put up just 50 cents in every hundred dollars that it's spent in this budget towards the environment and towards climate action. If there's anyone in this place, if there's any senator and any member of parliament that can't say that the biggest challenge our nation faces, the biggest economic challenge, the biggest social challenge, the biggest environmental challenge, the biggest political challenge is climate change. If they can't say that, then they are quite simply in denial. They have their head in their sand. And if that is the case, why has it had so little attention from this government? Well, indeed, why has this government thrown fuel on the fire by funding fossil fuels? And sh shamefully, we just saw that in the Senate this afternoon with legislation gagged to provide public funds for fossil fuel projects. The public expect a lot better from us, Acting Deputy President, and the Greens will deliver on that for the Australian public at the next election. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Wish-Wilson to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
against, I believe the ayes have it.